So, hi. Um, I don't have any slides, and I won't take, hopefully, too much time. But I just wanted to sort of echo the things that have already been said and probably what, what um, RMS is going to talk about. And I think what we need is a big picture vision of what people actually want to do with their computers. Because I think that part of the thing that has failed is that um, a lot of people who are working on technological solutions are trying to solve very specific problems, and they solve them in a sort of, uh, either in an ivory tower in the case of academia, no offense uh, intended there, or in you know a very personal way for free software people. They have a specific thing they want to do, and they do it. And very rarely is this cohesive. And very rarely do those things go well together, and sometimes they don't, um, they don't compose in a way that, that works well. Um, so if we think about the big picture, what, what Christian is talking about is a part of the big picture. But we need to think about it like, how would you build a dating site on a system like that? How would we make it so that it's integrated into daily life? How would we make it so that it became a part of the social functions that we actually have? so that we would use it naturally? How can we share music on it in, in, in a way? How can we actually use data centers in a way where we can get one property, let's say availability of that data, and we can prove that it's available? But then we can also decentralize it so that if it goes down, we don't actually lose access to our data. Um, I think to do this, we need free and open hardware, openly specified, freely available, free as in free software, free as in free hardware. We also need a free software operating system. So this is what the GNU project and the Free Software Foundation have been working on for longer than I've been alive. Um, these things are absolutely critical to do that. And one of the, the sort of key things to tie together all of this is, for example, cryptography. But another thing is about verifiability. So when you build software right now, if you compile, let's say, the Tor browser today, we have a new version of the Tor browser, which we're soon going to release, and it is a beta that you can test. If you compile it on your computer, or Richard compiles it on his computer, the actual resulting binary is identical. And this is because we want to make sure that if someone downloads a binary of the Tor browser from us, that they will actually have the same one that they would build from source. And then many people around the world can sign the hash um, of the actual thing that we think we are releasing, and then there's no reason to just trust us. You can build it from source and make sure it's identical. And then you don't have to have, um, for example, the uh, ability to do uh, disassembly or decompile uh, any parts of the object code. And then if you have all the source code, you can see what actually is the result. So that kind of verifiability, we need that also for hardware. We need a way to openly look to openly specify and freely specify a board, sort of like the stuff that Sebastian has been doing, and then to be able to take a random board, x-ray the board, and make sure that it matches. And we need software to do that so that we can actually look at the board and see that it does what we think it does. And then we need to be able to take the source code and do the equivalent of that so that we can actually verify it. And that will be very hard to accomplish for entire operating systems. Um, but when we have these kinds of systems, it really, I think, gives us some great opportunities. And I think it's, I mean, it allows us to say, hey, is there a backdoor in the CPU? Well, we can inspect the source code for the entire CPU because it's written in VHDL or something like this, and then it's loaded into an FPGA, and we know this FPGA has certain features, and we can identify them with an x-ray to see that, in fact, those features are there. And you can pay someone to reverse engineer a particular board to shave it down to make sure that it does have what we think it does. So if we, if we apply that, all through and through, it means that these things become more accessible, or at least they become verifiable. And at least we have some way to sort of trace through the entire picture. And then with cryptography, we can link up with other systems like this, and we can have applications on top that people actually care about. And so then it's not a, a, a house of cards, let's say. Because at, at the moment, we have a lot of free software, and it sits on top of uh, non-free hardware. And if I was a betting man, um, and I am often, um, you know, I would say that that's a problem. I wouldn't exactly say why, but I guess there's plenty of stuff that shows that it is a problem, but I would say that it's a problem. I think that Sebastian has convinced me of this. That's pretty much my main reason for believing that, in case there was any question about that. But looking at, at, at for example, Intel CPUs with the microcode updates, those appear to be signed with a 2048-bit RSA key. Well, if Intel is an American company, and Intel has the ability to push out microcode updates to the CPU, and they sign them, 
and you actually fetch them over HTTP, I might add, without any encryption, um, what does that tell you? It means you, even if you shave the chip down, um, it would be possible for them to just load in some microcode to change the way your CPU works, and when your machine powers off, it goes away. So we need to, we need to be able to understand the edges of those things, and in, right now, I think we actually just can't do that very well at all, and that's a really big problem. And I mean, there's literally one person in the world, maybe two people in the world, that are really working on this in, open, uh, in, in the open. One of them is Bunny, who created the Chumbi and is working on an open laptop. That open laptop, I think, is a key project because when we have an actual open and free laptop, we can use that to build other things. So for example, he's also, on his blog, he documented that he's working on a router. So that's a really fantastic thing because it means that with those two devices, we move closer towards having the free hardware and free software reality where we don't have to trust a corporation to give us some binary blob and to keep us secure or to hold a key and then that key, of course, who knows who else has it, right? If I were guessing how the business records uh, provisions um, for the NSA works, I would guess that they can probably ask companies for things that they consider to be uh, relevant business records. And if they think your data is a relevant business record, I suspect that things that impact the integrity of your data will be the same. So I think the big, big picture is that we need to think 30, 40, 50 years out into the future. The way that, the, the way that Richard Stallman thought about free software, I suppose, in the beginning, I wasn't there, I wasn't even born, but uh, to think in the big picture, not about freedom as in very small scope freedom, but freedom as in the big freedom, the freedom, liberty, to be at liberty. And, and that's really the core, I mean, in my, in my opinion, the core of why free software is such a radical idea for a lot of people is that it's not just about software. It's about the ends that the software bring into the world and about what people end up being when they have free software versus when they have proprietary software. And so the same is true, I think, for hardware. And I think when we have these things, we have the, the sort of grounding, the underpinning for a much freer society or free societies over the entire planet. And we're never going to get off this planet and, ex and explore space if we don't solve a lot of these problems at home, I think. And uh, I want to die on Mars, but not when we land, I think, is the, is the phrase. Um, so I'm hoping we can really have free systems like this, and we can really normalize understanding them and fab them, but also to study them and to change them in the case of software. And in the case of systems that are built on FPGAs, we may be able to dynamically change the hardware by having software. So the thing we need to fab is a very simple thing, and the ability to change that thing becomes a matter of changing software. So a software-defined radio, for example, that uses an FPGA is a really, really incredible and powerful tool. So we can have a use for it today, and in 10 years you can literally change it to do something else that the original designer didn't think of. So it really gives us the ability to hack the planet, sorry for the pun, but really it allows us to do stuff that we can't really do right now. Um, coincidentally, the router that Bunny is building has a Spartan 6 FPGA inside of it. So it's clear that other people have this, this line of thinking, and I think that's really brilliant. And I wanted to just sort of encourage that and to see the big picture of tying it together. And I think that we can self-fund almost all of this. We don't need the state. We usually don't need the state. I know that most Europeans love the state, and I like your state too right now. But, um, you know, an, an individual's alliance with the state is a temporary one. Right? And the state decides when they want to end it. And you usually don't have much of a choice. I say that as someone who is currently applying for a visa in Germany. So, um, you know, sometimes states don't do the right thing. So it would be great if we can find a way to economically finance this in a way where the state's power is removed from the equation, for the most part, in terms of sustainability. But maybe in the beginning, some of the funding comes from the state, because right now the state is, in fact, friendly. So the fact that Christian Grutoff doesn't have $2 billion in research grants is understandable, because it's hard to understand these big concepts. And yet at the same time, when the economic espionage cost is in the billions of euros, one has to wonder why we're not investing in thinking of these solutions um, and really actually trying to understand these spaces. Because a lot of these things are really hard to comprehend, but also to solve. So we really need to be working on that. So if you have any interest in these things at all, even just a passing one, you should really come and talk with Christian or myself or other people that are working on these things. because. It, I think this is a, a good 40-year research problem, and if you only put five minutes into it, it's very appreciated. Um, and, and the end result, I think, is that we can really have a much freer planet, and individually we will be more free, which is, I think, worth doing. 
And I think the outcome of not doing this is, pretty, is, is likely to be quite tragic. And you can see this, for example, with people that are stuck with Apple-related uh, hardware and software, because you'll see that they want to change certain things and they are unable to do that, or they want to reprogram and repurpose their devices with free software. For example, the Tails uh, bootable live CD, which helps to torify all the things you do on your computer, boots into Debian. It'll probably work on this laptop in front of me, but Apple has changed their newer hardware so that it doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. It wasn't because of Tails that they made this change, but it's very, very difficult to make Tails work on this. And now we'll have to do substantial engineering changes to Tails to make that work. Well, if the core of the system was core boot, instead of this garbage EFI stuff that has been forced down our throats, um, that maybe would be a different outcome. Uh, maybe it would be exactly the same, but I think it would be different. And, and so we really need to look at, at, at replacing these kinds of things and also think about it as being not actually so sexy. I mean, they have great design, but it is the aesthetic of slavery in a sense, where you are not free. You are only free to do what Apple says. And it isn't just Apple. It's Microsoft, it's Google, it's other places. And a lot of people are locking these things down. And so we need to work on building alternatives. And I think the best way to do that is to actually figure out what we want to do when we have any system at all. And then we will actually be able to start to build those alternatives that will respect our freedoms with free software and with free and open hardware. And hopefully we can freely communicate and freely read when we have anonymity systems and we distribute and decentralize in a secure way. So that was a whole lot. I had a mate, thank you. So. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. I also want to make a comment about X key score, if any of you are interested in that. Yeah, of course. Okay, so what we learned about X key score, if, who here did not hear about X key score? Raise your hand if that doesn't mean anything to you. Please, one person, thank God. All right, so uh, X key score wa was very uh, seriously hinted at in a bunch of documents. And then yesterday, or the day before that, The Guardian released a whole bunch of slides about X key score. And my read on those documents, which should just terrify everyone, but not to a point of inaction, but should still be scary, is that these guys basically built a distributed TCP dump for the entire planet. They have a ring buffer where they store multiple days worth of all of the internet's traffic in this ring buffer. This sounds a lot like the Tempora system um, that GCHQ is running for the United Kingdom. And then they're able to search inside of the ring buffer through a distributed sort of graph like, as I mentioned to Christian, it's sort of like Google for uh, a surveillance system where they have these queries that uh, basically have a hierarchy and then they flow downward. So one person types a query here and it flows out to hundreds of nodes around the world and then it looks into that data. Well, so attacks only get better. And those slides were five years old. So if, if the slides were from 2008 and those are three days of buffer, I'm guessing in five years they've got more than three days. So that is really terrifying stuff. And uh, it's particularly terrifying because the way that they do these queries suggests that they look for what we would call a protocol distinguisher on the wire. So they look for information. And if you can search for it, that is, if it's indistinguishable from noise, they're going to have a hard time searching for it. But if it's distinguishable from noise, like it's an identifier, like your email address, then they can put that into the search. And then it will pull data out of that and then feed some of that return data back. Presumably, they have automated queries that do this all the time from the rest of what the slide says. And presumably, that means that it's a kind of data retention based on these selectors. So the more that we turn signal to noise, that is, the more that the internet is totally encrypted, the less we care about systems like that existing, regardless of whatever political situations we come up with. So I think it's really important to do that. And it's also very important that we have ephemeral keys not long-term keys, because what they also talk about in these, these slides is a group called TAO, or Tailored Access and Operations. So Tailored Access and Operations is the black hat arm. I mean, I guess if you want to insult quality black hats, but they're the black hat arm of the NSA that breaks into people's computers. And we could just call them green hats, actually, <laughs> or whatever a green hat is that loves the state. That's some sniveling version of a green hat. And so the thing is that that is totally, absolutely terrifying. Because they're able to do uh, a query to the database, and they say this in the slide, give me all the vulnerable computers from country X. 
Well, then they break into those computers. So it's an active attack. So that means that anonymity, literal anonymity in the set of data they have, allows you to have a kind of herd immunity, if you will. But they also flip it on its head and they say, look for things that are encrypted. So that's because encryption is still rare as of 2008 with those slides. But the more difficult it is for them to do targeted stuff with a dragnet data collection set, um, I think that tells us we're making progress. So we can actually measure it. And I sort of like to make a joke about Bill Hicks here and say that there's a war on your privacy and every time you use encryption, you're winning it. And, and literally that seems to be the case with the slides that were released by The Guardian. So these things actually make a difference. And so when you work on crypto software and you work on free software that can be verified and free hardware that can be verified, we actually are, we're actually making that, making that and changing it in a way that is in fact making a qualitative and quantitative difference in the way that these people can violate our rights. So we live in the golden age of surveillance, but it turns out that we can end it for the most part, unless we're wrong about all the crypto. Then we're fucked. <laughs> I, so are there any questions? No? Any? Yeah, don't be shy. All right, well, thank you. Oh. Yes. Do, do you think um, that the Utah Data Center um, is built for uh, pumping up the space to uh, um, store all the data for uh, systems like Xcore? Yeah, so the question was about the Bluffdale NSA complex, which is in Bluffdale, Utah. And I believe that the Bluffdale complex is what's called an MDR, or a massive data repository, which is basically a gigantic hard drive farm. It, it seems to have something, I think it was Dan Bernstein said it's like 35 megawatts of power. Uh, Warren Buffett owns the power, uh, power station nearby. Um, I doubt it's a green power station. Um, this guy's just evil thrown through on accident, I'm sure. But um, they seem to just want to store data there. And there seems to be a lot of interconnection going there, so presumably that will be, um, you know, that's like your uh, data special line. That's like for the planet. It's the planetary version. Something like 100 years of data, I believe, is the goal, uh, w is what I've heard thrown around. So the thing is that there is MDR 1, 2, and 3 that I know about, at least. That's only one. So good news, it's only three. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, you had a question? Okay. Hello? Um, Hello? My question is regarding the FPGAs. Um, uh, are you trusting Altera and so on, or are you planning to do your own uh, production? I'm not planning to fab any FPGAs uh, at all. I, I mean, I, I am interested in the, the ability to make free hardware, but uh, I doubt that I'm ever going to actually open my own fab. But how, how we are supposed to trust Altera and so on with these uh, FPGAs? I mean, they could be compromised as well. So and there are even uh, fewer uh, manufacturers for that, so it's kind of much easier uh, attack for the agencies. So I won't answer that question, but Sebastian, I'm sure, will if he wants to come up here. And I would say that we shouldn't let perfection be the enemy of good enough. Right? right now, we're pretty sure that there is a way to update Intel CPUs uh, microcode, because in fact there's a way to do that and it's supported by the Linux kernel and you see it, it's in all these different systems. So we know for sure that there's a way to update that stuff. We don't know for sure about FPGAs in that way, and there's also a clear path to doing it. And, you know, obviously people will find a way to hack that kind of stuff, but we should try to think about the big picture, which is it's much easier to verify an FPGA than it is a proprietary CPU that's constantly changing all the time. So. Oh man, that's uncool. You have a phone. So I think PGA is it can be compromised, of course, but it's much harder to actually insert a backdoor inside an FPGA. I mean, a hardware backdoor. I mean, backdoor which is engraved into the chip itself uh, for two reasons. The first is that FPGAs are more flexible than CPUs. You can load many more different circuits in the FPGA, and it's at the, it's, it is at a very low level. So. They would have to like uh, have a, the backdoor would be capable of analyzing very high level behavior from very low level behavior, and that's extremely difficult to do. And the second reason is that uh, when you look when you put an FPGA into an electron microscope, you see a very regular pattern. 
So when you, but when you put a CPU, a CPU is just a lot of random logic. So when you want to insert a backdoor, and the backdoor has to be complicated for the reason I explained before, it would have to use a lot of transistors. It would have to use a lot of chip area. So it would be uh, much more visible on the electron microscope than if it was just some uh, little piece of logic in a CPU. But of course, it might be possible, but it's extremely difficult. So maybe the good answer is to manufacture your own chips, which is also possible, but it's also quite hard. So FPGS for now is still a pretty good solution, I would say. So that woman had her hand up, and then I think I'm done with questions. Let's do it later. Yeah, are you sure? She's the only woman to ask a question. I really feel like we should let her answer. Jake, we know that you can answer questions for four hours. I'm not going to answer for four hours. But I'm hoping it's for Sebastian. The question? No. Oh, OK. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's a more general question. Um, like, you know, with all the things going on, what's the agenda? Like, business people, they tend to divide agenda into, like, you know, we have a 10 days goal, a 10 month goal, and a 10 years goal. So, yeah, I know it's like very business crap and everything. But, um, just, you know, there's so much discussion going on and, and you say so much about like, you know, Germany's kind of keeping the discussion alive. Yep. So, I mean, they, 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 I'm, I'm a bit worried that it's just going to die off, you know, because the, the conversation is so complex and it takes so long, like, you know, you have Snowden sacrificing yourself and, and you know, like pushing the debate, but that'll go for, for just so long and that's going to end. I don't know the answer to your question. Sorry, we can talk. But you know, but yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that there are many different goals, and the free software goal is a, it's a, it's a, it's a human achievement goal. It's a, it's a forever goal, and we need it immediately, and we need to improve on it immediately. The same is true for hardware, and the same is true for the networks that we build. And I think in the short term, we have almost all of this right now, but it's only hackers that can really make it work. So in the next couple of years, we should make it so that it's generally available to people, so that we have a solution that a policymaker, for example, or a business person can turn into a business plan or an actual strategic goal for a country that doesn't have to be kept secret, that people will respect, that respects their liberty. And that's a much bigger conversation, I think, than I would even want to try to have right now. But it's also the question, I guess, is to yourself, which is like, what do you want to do as part of the goals that are being outlined tonight? And whatever that is, if you want to help us do business development on this stuff, I'm sure you can imagine some of us have no clue about that. Um, so we could use help. So if that's the division of labor that you fall into and you want to help with that, please come and talk with us about it. Thanks.